I would like to call on stage a person from San Francisco who float here, and he is a pioneer in cloud computing, including cluster-based internet services and the CAP theorem at Google, led the rise of Kubernetes and new, now leading, new leading open source security and the open SSF. So please welcome with a huge applause on stage, Ari Brewer with the presentation, Open Source Security, the world needs our help. Our help. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. That was fun. Thank you. Well, happy to be here. And uh, it's, uh, it's a beautiful place to be on a lovely day. So that's like, off to a good start already. And we'll do a little bit of presentation and go to some questions at the end. And honestly, you can ask me questions that are outside the scope of my talk as well, since I covered a bunch of other things in the intro. So. The good news is open source has been wildly successful and it's used kind of everywhere, like all the clouds, a lot of our infrastructure, including things you might not think about like electrical grids or water supplies. It's also uh, incredibly productive. I suspect all of you use open source. I'd be surprised if anyone in this audience didn't make active use of it because building on it gives you quite a platform for uh, faster innovation. Try to imagine doing all that stuff without anything to build on. That would be tough. And of course, you know, we want this process. We want the innovation. We want the rate of change. That's great. However, we've kind of been cheating a little bit, meaning we've been taking all the good stuff of open source. We haven't actually done it in a way that's very sustainable. And it's kind of an analogy to climate uh, change in the sense that if you, you know, burn fossil fuel, you can get a lot of energy, but it's not sustainable. If you just take from the ecosystem of open source, and you don't give back, it's also not sustainable, right? And where it shows up is in the lack of maintenance and, and subsequently in the lack of security. So this is actually, I think, an existential threat to open source, meaning that if we don't figure this out, open source actually is in danger of being used less, not more. And that would be a, a sad problem. Uh, and so I, I view this as an industry problem. It is not a Google problem. It is not a US problem. I was meeting with the government of Germany yesterday talking about their view of open source and why it's critical to Germany. But I think it's critical to pretty much almost all the countries on the planet. And for the same reason, almost all countries have built their infrastructure on top of open source and are now trusting it. Whether it's trustworthy or not, we are trusting it. So let's make it trustworthy. Uh, to do that, I also started the OpenSSF, not by myself, but that's a foundation dedicated to open source security and particularly supply chain issues. It's part of the Linux Foundation. Uh, we just hosted a big summit with the U.S. White House to try and get government and other players involved in how do we work together in this front. I won't talk much about that today, but I will show some of the example projects. So the first thing I want to do is actually walk you through a supply chain attack because I think it's a term that people hear about and they don't actually realize why it's worse than kind of regular vulnerabilities. We've had vulnerabilities in open source kind of forever and you know we have maybe more of them now or maybe the more visible like log4j is something that happened this year but it could have happened the year before something like it will happen next year. It is not that special as an attack vector. Supply chain attacks I think are more special in the sense of they're not an attack they're a sequence of attacks, or arguably even an attack factory, by which I mean when you make one attack on the supply chain, that in turn gives you many attacks in parallel on the users of that system. Right? So you get an explosive effect on the, what you're able to do with these attacks. SolarWinds is the famous one in this space that got all the attention. Uh, it's actually a mix of proprietary software and open software. CodeCov, which some of you may use, is the purely open source example. So I'm going to walk through that one today because it's easy to talk about and we have lots of good data on it. But they're basically very similar. You create an attack on the supplier, then everybody that uses that supplier is subject to new attacks, and that's where you get the escalation. So this example I'm walking through comes from Mercari. It's a Japanese retailer. Uh, they basically have a uh, merchant site where they have lots of merchants selling stuff to lots of customers. Uh, they order $100 million a quarter kind of uh, business, pretty good retailer. And they were nice enough to make, make a report about their experience with the CodeCov attack. And uh, I think I applaud them for sharing this information. It helps everyone learn. And they did a nice job, so I will use their examples. 
But this happened to tens of thousands of groups. Like, this is not a Mercari problem. This is an industry problem. So what is the first step of this attack? Well, essentially, the first step is you have to attack CodeCov itself. And the way this was done, uh, and I'll get to more on how CodeCov works, but basically, we're going to essentially change the uploader that CodeCov uses. So what is CodeCov? It's a uh, test coverage tool. So you do testing typically in GitHub. This is based on GitHub Actions. So after you run your tests, the GitHub Actions schedules test coverage. That test coverage data gets collected up to the CodeCov site, and then you can go to their site and kind of see your overall test coverage across many different tests. So it's a useful service. Toast test coverage is a good thing to do. We should be looking at test coverage in general. How it works, though, is it has a little bash script that uploads the, the details of the coverage test up to the CodeCov site to collect the data. That isn't a problem per se, except that this bash loader is, is subject to attack, and in fact was attacked. So phase one is basically attack the, the CodeCov bash script. Well, how do you, you know, how do you do that? <laughs> and CodeCov, like many, many groups, probably some of you in this room, whether you know it or not, made the mistake of putting their credentials in their Docker image. That's an easy, convenient place to put them. In fact, you can scan GitHub and other things that are public for credentials in Docker images, and you'll find some. Uh, attackers do that. Now, actually, Google does that, and GitHub does that. We do it because we want to find it before the attackers find it, and so we can try to get rid of the credentials in the Docker images as a defensive mechanism. But nonetheless, credentials in Docker images are, are a bad thing, but not a crazy, uncommon thing. And so the attacker, in this case, found that CodeCov had credentials in one of their container images, took those credentials out of the public image, and then they basically used those credentials to upload a modified version of the CodeCov uploader. Right? And the, the important point here is that this is, it's, it's from CodeCov, right? If you were to look at the signature of the CodeCov bash uploader binary, or script, it's actually, I think, just a script, it is signed by CodeCov. Is it from CodeCov? No. <laughs> it's from an attacker who has CodeCov's credentials. But it looks like it's from CodeCov, and you're very reasonable. Many well-run groups, like HashiCorp, said, oh, we're using the CodeCov bash uploader because it's signed by CodeCov, right? And Mercari also did that. As a side note, it's worth pointing out that just because the binary matches the signature it's signed by CodeCov doesn't, there's other ways to tell it's actually not the right one. There's two long-term ways. Uh, one way, the easiest is the second one, is that CodeCov could actually look at it and see, is this actually what we posted or not? Because they know what it's supposed to be. So they could actually go look at it and say, is it still what it's supposed to be? That, that's one check. The other check that models what we do for SSL certificates is, is you can have a a public log that's immutable. Uh, this is kind of like a blockchain. We don't use blockchains for this. We use an older technology called a transparency log, but it's basically a blockchain. For this, you can put things this way. You, you actually put the hash on the blockchain. Now you have a third party place to look and say, what is the CodeCov signature supposed to be? What is its secure hash supposed to be? Then you look at the one that you're actually using. Does it match? It wouldn't match, right? So there's, there's some. I'm not going to go into those other than say that there are things like this. This is kind of what SigStore, if you've heard of SigStore, is kind of hoping to do. Basically do a transparency log of hashes so that there's a, a, another place to look for the hash besides the object itself. But all that's to say that attacker changed the bash upload script and uploaded it. So that's the first attack. So what happens? The second part is customers, in this case Mercari, do a build, right? And they'd run their test cases. And now they get a GitHub action that says, oh, you ran your test cases. Now it's time to upload your credentials. Right? So in an automated scheduled action, the bad version of the uploader gets run. And what does it do? Well, it, it, it actually does upload the credentials. I'll get back to that point in a minute. But it also sends data to the attacker. So now we're in phase two. Now we're attacking the customers of the supply chain. And again, just don't think of this in Macari, think of this as 10,000 attacks in parallel on 10,000 different customers. Right? And that's a real number. I'm not making that up. Right? It's at least 10,000 attacks. All right, so uh, first thing to realize is that the change the attacker made is actually uh, 
not a big change. In fact, one of the advantages of open source supply chain tax is all the attacks are actually in the open. You can look at the old version, you can look at the malicious version, you can diff them. This is the diff, is this one line. And it's worth talking about what this line does and why it also is only this one line. Because if you can change the uploader, you can make it do anything. So one question to think about philosophically is what should you make it do? And the answer to that is you should make it do exactly what it's supposed to do, plus a little bit more that it's not supposed to do. Right? Because that's how you stay undetected. And then, so what this line does is it is basically, I'm walking all the way from all the way to the giant screen, I like, uh, you know, curl basically create a, a, a put command for a, a web page, copy the environment variables, and this is all the environment variables, and send them to this third party website. This is the attacker's website, right? And so this, this one line basically copies the environment variables, sends them to the attacker's website. Why does the attacker want your environment variables? Because you were smart and you didn't put your credentials in your Docker image, so you passed them in as environment variables, right? Which is the right thing to do, actually. It's one of the few good ways. You can do secrets management, you can do secret volume in Kubernetes slightly better, right? The bottom line is lots of people use environment variables so that they're not storing credentials in their Docker image. Attackers know this. Attackers say, oh, I'll kindly take your environment variables then. So what this line is doing is this line is fishing for Mercari's credentials, whatever they're passing in to their system. And in fact, it got their credentials. The good news is they only passed in their GitHub credentials, which thankfully were different than their production credentials. Good, 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 good thing. <laughs> Don't mix your production credentials with your non-production credentials. Because if they were the same, they would have gotten the production credentials. By the production credentials, that's hard to say, uh, by definition. The other point here is, uh, besides it's ex exporting those things, is that actual code cuff functionality is preserved, right? So it is actually uploading the test coverage correctly. If you go look at the website, your test results are there. From an operational perspective, you cannot tell that it isn't working properly, right? It is working properly, except for this little extra line that's copying your environment variables, right? And that's, that's a sophisticated attacker, no tr trying to stay hidden. So that's phase two. Phase three is now I've gotten my, my customer credentials, the customers of CodeCov, and now I can go see what those credentials let me do. Maybe I can grow into a, a third supply chain attack or attack something else. Maybe, maybe they had GitLab credentials. I'll go attack GitLab, right? Not to pick on GitLab, they're just another victim. And this, and they weren't victimized in this case, but really anyone, right? So in this case, these are Mercari's GitHub credentials, which means that you can see whatever ha Mercari has on GitHub. It also means you could modify Mercari source code. You could delete Mercari source code. Now, hopefully there's a backup and all that, but there are subtle attacks you could do by attacking Mercari source code. They didn't do that. What they're really doing were, again, looking for more credentials, looking for other valuable data. Um, what they actually got was um, Use some useful log. So it turns out in the GitHub repo were a whole bunch of logs. So all of the merchant PII, things like what is the address and banking information of our merchants, that was in the GitHub repository, not so much intentionally, but the side effect of being locked. Right? So that's, that's a bad thing to have lost. But they didn't lose their end user credentials, they didn't lose their production credentials, it could have been much worse. So that's, that's a supply chain attack. Uh, and that's a real one, and that's actually what happened. It, again, happened to many different groups. There's kind of the whole picture. But again, the good news is, is even though they lost control of their build environment and this GitHub stuff, all the production stuff, <laughs> good time to be a soccer player. <laughs> no, uh, no production credentials were lost. I'll take a breath. The, uh, I guess the long screen is not always helpful. <laughs> it's a little too long. <laughs> Another thing that's interesting about this uh, attack that I want to walk through is the timeline. I'm not going to go through the whole timeline. I just want to point out that yellow circle on the far end. I'll just know we'll use the laser pointer to point to it. Oh, no, I can't see the laser. Right, it's on a lit screen. Old school. Uh, because it was a hidden relatively well-hidden attack, it was two months before anybody noticed that anything was going on. That's a relatively long time. For, for two months, credentials were being harvested with no one knowing. 
after that two months, there's another period where people know something's going on, and CodeCub knows what's going on, but they maybe haven't quite figured it out yet, and they haven't told anybody yet. Right, so if you're a customer, you have the two months till they figure it out, plus another week and a half or something while they figure it out and then tell you, right? And then there's a whole other period which we don't know much about where leads the US government realized this is a lot of different customers and that's kind of where it got escalated into a bigger thing and there started being you know, rumors going around there's some big attack going on. Right? But that's a long time. Uh, and it's very hard to know for attack that long, what did you actually lose? Like what are all the things you built in that two month period? And what credentials did they have? You probably don't have logs that tell you that. Right? Google does some things on GitHub. We have some logs, but we're not 100% sure all the things we built on GitHub in that two-month window. Because we wouldn't, weren't expecting... Now, the good news is we don't do any of our major builds. Like, nothing that runs in Google Productions is built off of GitHub. We have our own source code repos and all that. But we have lots of experimental projects. We have employee projects. Some of those are on GitHub. Maybe they had credentials stolen. We don't really know 100% for sure. And I would think that's pretty typical for most groups, especially if it's not your primary focus, it's, right? But your non-primary focus still can have credentials that you care about. So stepping back, if you want to think about supply chain attacks a bit more broadly, this is kind of my generic picture of a supply chain from developer and source to building and deploying and, and having a place to store things like Docker images or packages, like a, like a Maven package before you finally deploy them. And when I talk about a supply chain attack, what I really mean is all of these arrows are places of attack, right? And that's kind of the make things that makes this a bit of a scary problem, right? Anyone that tells you they have a fix for the supply chain problem is kind of by definition lying. You need eight fixes at least. So if they're not bringing you eight fixes, they're not even playing the right game, right? Because if you don't fix all eight things, you're, whatever your least your weakest attack point is that's the one the attackers will use by definition. So I won't walk through these, but the ones that are circled are actually attack vectors that were used in the CodeCov attack. So this is a nation state attacker. They're pretty sophisticated, right? They're using multiple of these attack vectors simultaneously in the same, same attack. And you'll see more of that, if, at least if it's a nation state kind of thing. Uh, so this is going to be a hard thing to fix. <laughs> Google got attacked by nation states. Not, I've been there 11 years, and sometime early, around 2010, uh, a well-known large Asian country attacked Google uh, using sophisticated attacks and was successful. And since then, we actually had to rebuild all the ways we actually manage source code and do build systems. And so I think now we're in pretty good shape. In fact, our biggest risk part internally is our, is our use of imported open source. Anything that we build ourselves, I think we have really good control over. Stuff we import, we have less control over. Although it's, we're working on it. Uh, but the problem is, even though I think Google has solved this system, we can't just give you that solution. Because it's so Google specific, using a bunch of Google internal APIs, that it doesn't actually solve the problem you have. right? And the tools wouldn't be useful directly. So we're going to basically have to collectively rebuild the things we've learned from this system externally. And that's kind of what the rest of this talk is about. But just as an understanding, why is it a little bit Google specific? Well, we assume a giant mono repo, which would say all of the code is in one repo. That's pretty unrealistic for most groups. It has advantages, but it has disadvantages too. We force all of our users to use the same versions of any given library. Most companies can't set that expectation. You said you can only use this version of log4j and no other and you could enforce that, that actually has some value as a kind of a top-down mandate because it means you only have one version to secure. But in practice, most teams have autonomy. They can use whatever version of whatever language they want, right? So most of the time, you can't do that. We also have a single trusted build system. Like everything that goes to production is built by the same build system, essentially in the same way with the same signatures, right? If you're building stuff on your laptop or the desk, top or the workstation under your desk more likely, and it's got whatever random software on it, you really can't trust it as a build system for production, right? And so you can do that for stuff that's not going to production, like your normal copy, edit, debug loop. But if you're going to be serious about these attacks, because so many of the attacks are around the build system and the provenance, you really make, have to have an audited build system doing the actual builds that matter, 
So that one is one that's worth copying. Same with, uh, it's not on here, I don't think it's on here, no. But basically, we also have private copies of all the open source we use. So it's not like we ever pull a package off the Maven and Maven Central and like stick it in production. All right, there's two reasons that's a bad, reason, bad idea. One is we want to know exactly what software was used when we built something because later you might need to do look at it if you discover there's a vulnerability in it. So for, you need at least a copy for archiving of what you actually built. <laughs> so you're going to have to have a copy no matter what because, again, the upstream copy will change, right? It may change after you've taken a, a snapshot of it. So we have a private copy for that reason. The second reason of a private copy is we often want want to make security patches, right? And we can't patch the upstream version in general, right? So we patch the local version, we try to get the patches upstreamed, but that'll take, could take 30 days, could take two days, could take three months, could be never. We have some patches that have never been taken upstream, right? Because the maintainers don't agree with the patch, right? So another reason we have a private copy is so that we can have private patches. We also happen to know all of the reviewers and all of the code authors and all the things they've ever written in their history at Google, which is, again, a bit draconian. So it means if we think you wrote a malicious change, we can go look at all the other pull requests or CLs you've ever submitted, and are any of them suspicious, right? Is there a pattern there? Like, are you suddenly submitting stuff for a Java, but your whole time at Google you've been a Go programmer, right? Those are things that are suspicious. That doesn't mean it's bad, but it means it's worth a second look. Right. That, some companies can copy that, but my main point is there's, this is whatever we built, even though I think it works, it's very googly, and I don't mean that in a good way. It's very googly, and, and it fits our little island of how technology works, which is not the same as the rest of the world. But the principles are right. Like the idea of a trusted build system is the right principle. Uh, trying to understand, at least, if not enforce, what libraries are in use is a good principle. A private repo, good principle. So out of this came something called Salsa, which hopefully you've heard of, but you probably haven't if you're not at least thinking about this space, which is a, it's not code, unfortunately, it's just a framework. So here's a framework that says, what are the properties you want in your supply chain such that you can prove to yourself that it's trustworthy? So you can think of these as, on the, these things on the right here are essentially invariants. Like um, source integrity is, do you know exactly what source code was used in your build? Meaning it, no, it was not tampered, you have a copy of it, the copy matches the secure hash of the version that was used, it could be a git hash typically, right? That's a useful property, do you know exactly what source code was used? Uh, hermeticity is another one, that's the property that when you were doing the build, it was from immutable inputs, right? They weren't allowed to change. Like, you, you know, if you have some packages have a pre or post install script, which means they go to the internet or can to do some calculation to figure out what to install, right? It, that's not good, right? We don't want that. In fact, in general, we should remove all pre and post install scripts if we can, because it means you don't know what you're installing until after you've installed it, which is too late. Right? We actually need to separate what's going to be installed from what, when you install it. That's a, that's a separate talk. Anyway, these are all uh, useful invariants. And I think, so the way to think of this as a table is basically there's invariants we'd like to have. They're not all easy to get. So the columns are the easier ones on the left. So salsa level one is really basic stuff like do you know your source code? Salsa level two, you can kind of think of it as do you have a trusted build system? Like is it... Do you know what binaries are using your build and what scripts? And are they checked in? Is there an audit log? Can they only be run by service accounts versus by users on their laptop? Right? That's what I mean by a trusted build system. That's pretty achievable. And it's, it's, I think most groups that are serious should get to a trusted build system that produces audit records of what was built. Right? And then you can get farther and farther out. And, and you know, at, at the end here, you're doing kind of all the things that Google does, or not in the way that Google does them. At least you're meeting the same properties. And I'm not saying that's easy, but it's a framework you can talk about, are these the properties you want? And by the way, you can have your own opinion if you think these are more or less important, but I think these are the properties in general we know that you need to actually have a secure supply chain. And we're, by the way, building all, all these things in public forums in various ways. So I'll just cover a few other things, and then we'll, we'll wrap up and move to questions. Um, this is an open SSF project that's worth knowing about. 
it's trying to tackle the problem that it really has two goals. So what it is, is it's kind of a scorecard for a open source project. And it's scoring it basically on relatively actionable, simple security metrics. So a security metric would be something like, do you use two-factor authentication? Because if you don't, then your credentials might get stolen and someone else might be making updates on your behalf that you wouldn't make yourself, right? That's risky. Another one is, for example, do you have more than one maintainer? <laughs> it turns out about 30% of open source projects have one maintainer. And, you know, think about the, the colors library or something where that maintainer can kind of go off the rails, so to speak, and make whatever change they want, and there's no check and balance by any other maintainers to say that's a bad idea. Right? You put a lot of trust in one maintainer in that case. Um, so there's a whole bunch of these, but the, the, there's really two ways to use it. It's kind of like a little bit of peer pressure to maintainers. So here's some properties that you could achieve that are easy and actionable. You can tell when you're doing better. It, it improves the, high, the hygiene for all the projects. Right? It makes them less risky. From the consumer side, which I hope it will get used as well, you can say, I only want to use projects that have a reasonable scorecard score, because that means they care about security, right? And try to get some back pressure to improve security from the consumer end. Right now, people don't really look at security of what they consume. Even big companies, even big governments don't look at the security of the code they consume. And they don't, it's not easy to do, right? They're not going to do, a d you can do an audit, right, for 30K. You can do an audit and get a very good report on security of an open source module. But that's... That's not scalable, right? Scorecards is not as good as that, but at least it's scalable and it pushes us in the right direction. So that's one little project. Another one that's worth knowing about is uh, devs.dev. This is a free uh, website that Google is providing. And what it does is you, for many different languages, you put in like a top level package, say like Tomcat or Apache web server, and then it will tell you the transitive closure of all your dependencies and all the vulnerabilities in anything you import, even indirectly, which is hard information to get, so it's very useful. Right? Most, like if you were asked people, do you use Log4J, most people would say no, and almost all of them would be wrong. 8% right? of Java packages, directly or indirectly, use Log4J. That's a very large number. Right? In fact, many enterprises found they were using Log4J even though they thought they weren't, because again, they weren't using it directly, they're importing something that imports something that imports something that's using log4j, right? But they're still vulnerable. It doesn't matter if it's a direct or indirect dependency, the vulnerability is still there. So you can try this website. You can also uh, use BigQuery to do it. There is a free tier for BigQuery, so this doesn't cost money. BigQuery is kind of a fun way to explore the data set. You can ask other questions, but really, it's the only way I know of to get a good sense of what are the actual transitive closure of the, of the dependencies that you are importing. Because right. you can't grep for that, for example. If you were to like, grep for log4j, you'll find the direct dependencies of something, but you won't find indirect dependencies that go through something that you're not looking at. This will find the indirect dependencies. And finally, a third kind of baby step project is trying to fix vulnerabilities. And what I mean by that is the CVE mechanism. And so CVEs, if you haven't used them, are basically, it's a vulnerability report, but it's a very manual process. It's like, here's a binary that has a vulnerability. It doesn't tell you which piece of software has the vulnerability. That's up to the reader to figure that out, right? which is a big problem. And also, the description of what the problems are and what the binary is are often in English, which means it does not enable automation. And so if you're going to have 100 vulnerabilities per year, maybe that's OK. If you're going to have 100,000 a year, which is more accurate to what we're at, you can't use manual processes to manage your vulnerabilities, right? It's not, it doesn't work. And so uh, OSV is a new database for vulnerabilities where th the main thing it's doing is, is doing precisions to enable automation, right? So OSV vulnerability says it is this package and it is this set of versions of this package that have the vulnerability. And therefore, we can tell using things like depths.dev which of the things that include those bad versions and which of those are tainted, right? You can't do that analysis if you don't have the detailed, precise vulnerability data at the root. So we actually have, need both these things together. The good news is a bunch of languages uh, have now agreed. Actually, Rust is now on here too. So the Rust vulnerability database is now using this format and will have precise uh, vulnerabilities as well. 
So this one I really, and it's not that we're going to replace CVEs, they're still going to exist. In fact, we're working on helping with CVE version 5, which will come next year, so that it at least is compatible with this format, so that we can, if you have precise vulnerability data, you don't lose it when you convert it to a CVE, you at least keep it. But this is really the thing to go for future vulnerabilities where you're worried about automation and notification and volume. All right, so last one is a bit more philosophical, then we'll move to questions. Um, open source is free as in puppy, <laughs> right? You could get the stuff for free, but it doesn't come without some obligations and without some torn up furniture, right? So we need to figure out how do we want this to work long term, right? And the answer is not tell maintainers to do a better job, right? Maintainers do a fantastic job, right, with no funding. And they don't even in general have funding for testing. Like, I, uh, the one that bothers me the most is ask people to run more test cases. Well, who's paying for the test cases? Right? It's totally unreasonable to tell a volunteer to pay for the test cases. For Kubernetes, by the way, Google pays for the test cases, and it's like more than a million dollars a year. Right? Now, it's a lot of test cases and a lot of runs, but the point is it's not ignoring even the significant human labor involved. Just the operating costs of doing security well is high. Right? And so we need a, a to get to a place, and this is one of the goals of OpenSSF, where things like there is OPEX available for projects, there is assistance available for projects that want it, at least. You know, it's not mandatory. It's like, we'll offer you things, and you take the ones that are useful to you. Um, but bigger picture, you know, it's, this is a, now a public infrastructure. I just told you all nations are dependent on open source. The first order, none of them help with the maintenance or security burden, US included. Right, and that's mostly out of habit, right? But conversely, you would say, is it okay to build a road and expect the users of the road to fix it? You could do that, you could say, okay, you, you, you use the road, please fix the potholes as you get to them. That would be a best effort pothole system, it would be a terrible system. That's where we're at with open source, right? Everybody fix your own potholes, and by the way, you only fix it for yourself typically because you're not good at put the, putting the changes back upstream. So that doesn't help either. So we, we kind of need to figure out something a bit more sustainable, figure out a culture, not so much for the maintainers, but for the government and corporate users about wh what is the right way to give back. If you're not willing to give upstream patches back, which is, I think, fundamentally wrong, is there some other way you can contribute financially or through other expertise or for cloud credits that says you have a role to play in keeping secure the things you're using, right? They're definitely using these things, right? But it's an asymmetrical consumption with not enough giving back. All right, so let's stop there. And I think we're at our zero and we can move to Q&A. And I think that's something that you guys have to put up on the screen. Or maybe not. <laughs> Congratulations, Excellent. I hope you did not fall big no. from the stage because- it Happened to land on my foot. <laughs> as a pro, I haven't seen that before, but it was really amazing that how fast you climbed up and continued from the <laughs> sentence you were there. So uh, I have something for you. Ooh. This is a really great Hungarian wine and it's dedicated for you from Craft Hub because of the great presentation. Uh, thanks a lot. Well, thank you so much, I appreciate You're that. Welcome. <laughs> and now as you see on the on Slido, we have few questions, so I would like to ask all of you guys to try to upvote and downvote the questions, because maybe we won't have time for all of those. So we will just go uh, with the most votes towards the uh, least votes to try to upvote and downvote. I give you a few seconds uh, to do so, and I will shoot some questions to you, Eric. So first of all, it's here too. So, okay, the first question: How is bad code introduced in open source projects? approved in a PR, does in, improper review process for OSS plays a role? So this is the first question for you. I think the, there's two basic answers to that question. First of all, the vast majority of vulnerabilities in your package are not in the code in your package. They're in the dependencies of your package, right? So then sometimes they're not even your fault other than because you're using those dependencies, you've taken on essentially the obligation to understand what they're doing. And again, you probably don't know what your nested dependencies are, 
But you're kind of, again, you, if you're indirectly using Log4j, you, you probably learned that this year, and it probably cost you some time to, to deal with that. Or maybe you didn't learn it, and you still don't know that you're using Log4j, but hopefully you know, and customers will certainly start knowing. So that's the first thing. You, the, the vulnerabilities are not in the code we're writing every day, typically. Most of them are indirect. But assuming it's directly in the code, the next point to, is to realize that there's no requirement that there's code reviews at all. Lots of projects don't do code reviews. Uh, and if you're a single maintainer project, <laughs> who's doing the review? <laughs> you can do your own review and okay. submit it and then like it. Uh, but I don't think that's the process. I'd be surprised, right? For Kubernetes, we're trying, to, of course, to do something with the higher standard. We have lots of people involved. My popular projects should be doing code review. There's no excuse for that. But there are lots of dependencies that are somebody's project five years ago that they don't even care about anymore. Right? Because, in the fact, they would tell you, don't use this thing. I don't work. In fact, earlier talk today, someone said, don't use that. I wrote it a long time ago. All the maintainers left. Use it at your own risk, right? But that's not what the web, you know, little readme says. Well, sometimes it says, don't use it. But usually it just says, untouched since 2018, right? Which should tell you, don't use it, right? That should, we should auto-translate that message to don't use it, but uh, we don't do that yet. That's a, that's a good idea, write that one down. <laughs> uh, but I don't think, most, to answer the question, most errors are not in the direct code, and if they are, they're not necessarily reviewed at all. So getting those two things would be a great start. Okay, so the audience yeah. would be interested in what is your favorite open source project, and have you ever contributed to any of these? I used to write code quite a bit. So the things that I contributed to in the long ago past were things like Nessie, which was the tiny OS thing that was uh, for the beginning of Moats, what you now call an Arduino. Uh, I wrote code for Inktomi, but then the problem with having me write code, I, I, I wrote like 60,000 lines for my dissertations. I, I was a good coder at a time, but when I got into Inktomi stuff, I realized that I was writing code but then I wasn't there to maintain it. So being a part-time coder or a coder that's like there, but then's like off to do business meetings or something, it's not, it's not the right ethic, right? So I, then I realized I just, I switched to doing code reviews. So I do lots of code reviews, mostly internally, and I, I still write code privately at home, like writing stuff like home automation and, and Go mostly at the moment. Go is my kind of language of choice at the moment. Um, so I write enough code to feel like I know what, what's going on, but you know, there's no Eric Brewer production code at Google. There was Eric Brewer production code at Inktomi, but that was like in the 90s and 2000s, right? So that's kind of dates me pretty well. Um, favorite project has to be Kubernetes, but I'm super biased on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a no-brainer answer. Um, which CI system would you recommend to lock down the build process? For instance, non-AFHOC provides provenance data yet. So Actually, which CI system would yes. you recommend? Um, the, the official answer, of course, is Google Cloud Build, which is starting to build all the provenance end to end. In fact, I th the way to think about Google's view of this space is not to have like, necessarily the best tool for all the different parts of the supply chain, but to make sure that we can connect all the metadata through all the parts of the supply chain. So, for example, you can have your code in GitHub, you can build it in in Google Cloud, you can store it in Artifact Registry, which is our version, or you can store it in JFrog, right? It's a very fragmented space, so I actually think it's more important that we try to agree on what is the metadata we want, and what is a, like, what does a good signed package look like, right? That is actually not agreed upon. In fact, we don't even agree on what the hash is. In fact, there was a, a test people were trying to do uh, S-bombs, you can think of as ingredients lists for packages, and a whole bunch of teams produced them for the same package, but none of the output actually matched which means there's no way to tell if it was, it's not reproducible, there's no way to tell from a third party is it correct or not. So that's not a Google problem either, but I do think a consequence of us being so fragmented is that it's gonna be hard to get any combination you want. So I do think because of the nature of this thing, people will get more serious about their build systems and have, even Google's doing this internally. Like we, we can't have 30 ways to build something. There has to be very few ways to build that everybody uses because maintaining a proper build system that's actually secure is a lot of work. And most companies, I think, in a few years will realize they don't actually want to use their random collection of 
Jenkins, not to pick on Jenkins, but any random collection of stuff because it's too hard to maintain it yourself. So I think you'll be running CI pipelines in the cloud, not necessarily Google's pipelines, not necessarily Google's cloud, but something where someone's giving you some leverage on having a trusted build system. It's kind of the most reasonable way to go in the long term for that. Okay, next question. Uh, who should provide the funding for OSS? The main beneficiaries are larger private companies, but they often do not contribute at all. It's a great question. The main beneficiaries in terms of actual usage are probably governments. And you know, lots of governments in Europe and the US are big consumers of open source, but again, no direct payback. Uh, I think it's fair to say Google is the biggest single entity contributing to open source in terms of like number of pull requests, number of people working on it. I think in 2020, 15,000 Googlers underpay from Google did actually make contributions to open source directly themselves. Right, that's a significant fraction of, that's at the time maybe 30% of the workforce of engineering workforce of Google. Right, that's in addition to some, the paying for the testing, like all the, the OPEX for Kubernetes, things like that. So I think Google's trying to lead by example here. OpenSSF, all of its members just committed $30 million to basically put towards funding the basics of open source things like hygiene and tracking vulnerabilities and helping get the worst ones fixed. But I don't think we actually have a great answer yet of even if you were, you know, like I talked to financial services companies, a lot of them would actually like to give money back in a better way. They often don't want to give their upstream changes back because they don't want to tell the attackers what they're using or what they're working on. But maybe they can give those changes back indirectly. I think we're helping facilitate that a little bit. Um, so the, the changes do get upstream is a bit more anonymized where they came from. We'll see. That's got its own problems. But I think the bigger issue is, you know, it's, it's not going to be a tax. It's also hard to pay open source maintainers, frankly. We tried this a couple years ago. It's like some maintainers don't want to be paid, believe it or not. They're like not interested, right? So that's the first problem. Uh, it's easier to pay OPEX, like, you know, testing for credits than actually paying cash. We've done both. We're still doing both as experiments. Uh, so I think OpenSSF or Linux Foundation has another role to play, and so does other foundations, PyPy and others, where they can be the middleman where, uh, you know, a bigger company can give them money as kind of one transaction that's kind of legally binding and easy for lawyers to understand, and the foundations can take on the harder problem of how do you give out small bits of money to lots of different people in lots of different countries, which is, is, a, is a real problem that needs to be solved. But I do think we'll start seeing a flow of money, at least for fixing things. Like, we've figured out bug bounties, but bug bounties are finding things, and we don't need to find more stuff. We have more stuff than we can fix. We need, to, we need fix it bounties, and so we're looking at that as a mechanism as well. But I would say open season for experiments, right? And I know there's a bunch of companies in here because I recognize some of you, and so companies should try these experiments too about what projects do you care about? How can you help those projects? You know, even if you pick 10 projects you use and help them, but try not to pick the same ten as every other company. Like don't pick Kubernetes. Maybe pick a dependency of Kubernetes deeper down the stack. Again, there's like 800 of those. So there's plenty to choose from, right? Plenty of them are not well supported. So I guess that's my answer. Okay, maybe hmm. one last question. Um, what would you recommend the JFrog X-Ray? I can't say I've used it, so I, I know people are generally happy with JFrog, but I don't, I've not tried X-Ray, and I can't say much about it. Sorry. Okay, with that, I would, rec I would recommend to hunt him down because he will be here with the, uh, with the conference today, tomorrow not. So if you have any questions, Eric is open to answer if you catch him from one, one stage at the other. So have a big applause, please, to Ray Brewer. Right, thank, thank you, you. Eric.